Bueno, so we're going to start a new session of the World Economic Forum Latin America Brazil. The first, I think that you all have the simultaneous interpretation receptor, so we're going to be speaking in English and Spanish. So you have the simultaneous interpretation to understand everything that we'll be discussing during this day. So we'll be speaking about agriculture, how to broaden the scale of uh, agriculture, so that how to scale up innovation in agriculture so that it can be more healthy or can be healthier. Well, I'll be taking this with, with these five panelists. So the thing is how innovation should be financed and also broad in terms of you. So tell them going to help me to answer this question. So here I have Mauricio Haddad. He is the president of Latin America of DSM. Thank you very much, Mauricio, for being here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Victoria Alonso Perez, she comes from Uruguay, and she is the founder and direct, direct, executive director of Chief Safer. And then we have from Norway, Svein Thor Hosseter. He is the president and chief executive officer of Yara International. And also we have the Minister of Agriculture and Livestock of Paraguay, Marcos Medina. And lastly, Patrick Strebi, founder and executive direct, chief executive director of Fair Trasa. So it's very clear that the food system today is unsustainable. Something is wrong with the microphone. Okay, we're back again. So I was saying that it's very clear that the food systems today are unsustainable for both the planet and also for human beings. And the idea or the question to all of you is how can we change this trend? How can we use the technology to change this trend? Mauricio, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mauricio Daddy, And I would like to start by saying by speaking about a topic that should be very much related to the improvement of innovation in, in agriculture, which is sustainability. I believe that speaking about innovation and speaking about something that is new but can also bring benefits can not only bring benefits to agriculture or to livestock without thinking that we have to look at the planet as a whole and it has to be sustainable. And two things that I would like to point out here and of course, I would like to give the opportunity for my colleagues to speak, so I'm not going to take too long. So the first thing is the importance of investments, investments that is required. And this in general is very difficult because for many entities, investments that is made and that is required innovation and also for the uh, research and development is like investing in a black box because you don't know exactly what will come out. So it is very important to see a discussion that we had yesterday for IND Latin America. And one thing that came up is resilience and funding. For example, in our corporation, every year, regardless of whether it rains or it's sunny, we invest from five to four, four to five percent uh, in innovation, four, four or five percent of our sales investment in research. And when we have a bad year, it's very difficult to think on the day of tomorrow because innovation in R&D, if you want to scale up, we have to think in the long term. So this is why investment is very important. Now an example. So what we do from the global perspective is that we have uh, a nutritional ad additive, which is for for animals, because we're speaking about agriculture and livestock. So focus on animals. This is a special additive. So we know that one of the major concerns from the sustainability point of view are the gases that are produced everywhere. So one of the gases that is more complicated is meth methane. When we compare the the cows, we can think that each one of them is like a BMW, w, a BMW, because they do produce a lot of gas, and there is an interest. 
on the part not only of the entities and governments, but also manufacturers of animal protein to reduce the number of gases produced. So for the last 10 years, we've been investigating this, and we want to bring come up with a molecule that can be used without changing, of course, the relationship with what is the usual digestion of the ruminant animals. But this molecule will reduce will reduce up, up to 30% the emission of methane by animals. This is, this is confirmed by studies. And this molecule also ha is able to increase the conversion of of the production, animal production. So it is inf it's a very important investment. So this is an investment investment that is very sustainable in R and D. But global investments that do not understand this local perspective is very difficult, especially when we develop a new concept for a new molecule in Europe or in the U.S. Immediately, Latin America will simply copy and paste that. That's the reality. So what we do is that we have these farms that are used one for ruminants, so this is for livestock, and the other one. We have just in recently invested in a research to understand how this molecule can be used in Latin America, which is different from the type of livestock that we have here. So this is why we conduct local research. And now we go back to the PPP. Usually I say PPPE because there are many PPP that are not efficient. So in this case, a PPPE is one that develops that make, performs development together with the University of Sao Paulo for this kind of studies. So it is very important investment and also resilient investment. It is also very important to understand that development can be done from the global perspective, but also we have to have a specific understanding of how it can be applied locally. So this is global, global development for local solutions. And how about you, Alonso Perez? Well, to start up, I think that we have to invest in agriculture, not only because, of course, this is an important industry for Latin America, but also for the human su for survival. And for two, 2050, the, pop the population will be 9, million, 9, 9 billion point eight people. So this means a, a high number of people. And what happens is that there is a report from the World Bank saying that the productivity will reduce by 50 percent, 25 percent. So as I was saying, the use of resources is very important. Now, in terms of livestock, we have a platform to monitor livestock remotely. And we know what the cows are at that precise, mo precise moment. And we can also uh, control or monitor genetics of this of this livestock, we depending on the climate also is monitored, and some certain animals can also uh, eat less, and they can they can get fat and faster. So we have to consider that we have only one planet. So we also have to consider the area that is limited for the livestock, and also we use the Internet of Things, and this is very important because then we also have sensors that are connected and sending information all the time. And so we come to a point in which we will not we will not live without our mobile services or mobile cell phones. And but do you know your your cell phone number by by heart? Because people do, they usually don't know that. So this is going to happen with agriculture too. So we will have to understand. We can we have to understand data so that we can understand better livestock and also get coached so that we can make better decisions. And this is very important for survival. Sven, how do you see this? <laughs> um, but Carol, as, as you said initially, the, the, the food systems uh, today clearly are broken. And, and looking at the numbers, they certainly back up that. Uh, 800 million people uh, go to bed hungry every night. Uh, mm -hmm. Agriculture is a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. 25% is from, from agriculture. Half of that is from, from change of land use. Um, and um, so, so, so from, from the starting point, uh, we have some real challenges. But I'm, I'm an optimist uh, looking mm -hmm. at uh, what, what is out there in terms of uh, technology and, and knowledge. It is possible to 
uh, grow enough food for the world, both today and also for the growth that we're seeing in, in the next 20, 30 years, where we will get to 9, 10 billion people by, by just utilizing that. But we need to think differently. And I think when it comes to innovation, it's important to think not just innovation in terms of technology and, and products, but also in, in terms of uh, collaboration and, and partnerships. And um, I was in a session in, uh, in the World Economic Forum in, uh, in, in Davos, and, and one of the, uh, or a head of the, one of the um, African farmer unions, uh, he made a statement that made uh, a big impression on me. And he said, when you think about innovation, make sure that you respond to the needs of the farmers and don't make innovation that create needs with mm -hmm. farmers. Because being a farmer is very complicated. And when we think about innovation, how can we make the everyday life easier for the farmer? So, so that's what I'd like to, to say initially, on, on not just focusing on product and technology, but rather also on, on, uh, on partnerships. OK. Ministro, tenemos. Well, Minister, I would also like to hear your view about this as someone who is in the government. So how is it to have a state that supports agriculture and is also on the side of agriculture to allow this innovation to be implemented also by the small farmers? Paraguay is a bilingual country, and our language, we have a very special tone to address these issues. So thank you very much for the question. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Bueno, with regard to the question, it seems to me that it's very important. But first of all, I would like to I would like to say this from the political point of view, because I come from the private sector. For five years, I've been in the government. So I know both sides of the coin. And the first thing I would like to point out is the importance of innovation and technology for countries, for emerging countries like Paraguay, especially for agriculture and livestock. Fifteen years ago, Paraguay was a country that was close to 50% when we started this implementation of technology. And 15 years later, Paraguay is now among the major producers of food in the world. We are the fourth, fourth largest exporter of uh, soy, soybean, and also the first of uh, meat, the seventh of um, corn, and we export wheat. We are the only subtropical country that exports wheat among other commodities. We are in the top 10. So this major advancement is because of technology, because of innovation that has been implemented, that has impacted very uh, strongly our economy. We are the most stable country in the region, although we have major or great uh, uh, neighboring countries. But we have maintained a a growth, an average of 5% a year. And our economy has an inflation rate that is below 5% every year. We have the same currency for the last 70 years. And it's very important that despite all the difficulties of our neighboring countries, we have been stabilized. And this is mostly because of innovation technology that we have put in place. And what is most significantly, we have reduced poverty by 50% which is now nearing 20 percent. Well, so when we speak about innovation, this is not only thinking about energy from the uh, food security, but also from the point of view of the in economic impact and also the social impact, and also, of course, environment impact that it has. What is then said about the farmers, I'm also a of livestock producers, so I understand very well the thing, the fact that technology and innovation should respond to the needs that the farmers or producers have. When we speak about needs, I think it's also very important to take into account innovation and the concept of technology. Because in the world, there has been a big debate about what 
what is a technology that can be accepted or not by the consumer? GMOs, for example. My country uses the GMOs, uh, genetically modified uh, organisms, and this has made a difference. But then some countries do not accept it. So this is key in innovation, and not only to see what the producer or the farmer needs, but also what the consumer will accept in terms of you know, uh, what results from this innovation, because eventually you can just produce something that will not be accepted by the consumer. And innovation and technology also has to cover sustainability. Everything that we do should be sustainable in three dimensions, economic, social, environmental aspects. And lastly, I would just like to restate that innovation has to have an impact on the social, economic, and political perspectives, and fundamentally has to answer to the needs the, of the farmer on one hand, but also the consumer on the other hand. Patrick, how do you take care of the f small farmers that are the ones that Fertraza mentioned? How can they have access to innovation? How they can really benefit from this innovation? farmers to compete with large-scale farmers who have economies of scale. And I think we need really to look at how can we find solutions that we can tap into that potential to link small-scale farmers with, uh, with global markets. Now we started, I started my organization in Mexico 12 years ago, focusing on the development of small-scale farmers and linking them with markets. We used the fair trade model and, the, uh, uh, and organic. Because at the very beginning, it was clear to me that if I want to do this as a social, as a social business, and I have higher costs at the production side, I somehow need to offset this. And I could do this because uh, there is somebody called like the conscious consumer who walks into Tesco, who walks into Whole Foods, and is willing to pay 20 cents more. Mm -hmm. And this is how we scaled uh, uh, our model from uh, one company to 15 companies in 12 countries. But the question now is, how can we scale? And this is the question of this panel. How can we scale this? And, uh, and I was thinking long and hard about this. And, uh, and now that we talk about the fourth industrial revolution, and we see how technology is disrupting every single sector, agriculture will also be one of them. And so we, have, we were looking at how can we use technology to really scale? How can we use technology that we can give a farmer the tools in his or her hand that they can be the best farmers, and how to link them with markets in a direct way. And, uh, and we are now at the point where we, we are very close to having a solution that really can uh, scale, and that, uh, that can scale globally. So I'm very excited. And as Sven was saying, is an optimist. I'm probably one of the biggest optimists you've ever seen. <laughs> and I think we need to be optimists. And, uh, and so I'm very excited to, to see how can we use technology to scale solutions that we can tap into that huge potential because the world needs it. Mm -hmm. We need to tap into small-scale farmers to link them <coughs> to global markets 
Because it is not just a win-win. It is a win-win-win-win. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you have a farmer who now lives in poverty who has better income. We address the food security challenge. You know, we connect to markets and we focus on sustainable agriculture. And if we do this, and if we do this in collaboration, as we heard this uh, on the panel, you know, we have to collaborate. It's not, the time is over where we can work as islands. Mm -hmm. The world needs to learn to work together, and this is what the forum is so good at, you know? Public-private partnerships. How can we work together to reach these important goals? Creo que Patrick, creo que Sven tiene algo por decir al respecto. Uh, yeah. You wanted to say something about it? Uh, I just wanted to build on what uh, Patrick said on, on the need to include the smallholder farmers, mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, and I said, Initially, that 800 million uh, people in the world go to bed hungry every night, and, and, and a large share of that are uh, smallholder farmers. So, how do we connect the smallholder farmers to the to the market? And uh, Yara is a fertilizer company, and um, in, in my line of, line of work, I spend a lot of time out with the with the farmers. Uh, I spent a lot of time in, in Africa, and I've seen it first hand how difficult it is to be a smallholder farmer without the whole value chain. We have examples of farmers that have followed the advice, they uh, increased uh, the crop yield, uh, but then there's no market for the, for the product and it rots. And it's really heartbreaking to see that they've done all the right things and then they're not connected to the market. Uh, but um, I also see some really good solutions to this, and, and um, it's uh, something called the Farm to Market Alliance, uh, which is trying to create scale for smallholder farmers. This is an initiative where the World Food Program, which is one of the largest buyers of food in the, in the world, have committed that a certain percentage of what they buy will be from uh, smallholder farmers. But then we need to create the full value chain. And, and here, uh, Yara, together with uh, Syngenta and uh, Bayer and uh, Rabobank and, and others, we have then tried to, to make a full value chain from the input to the farmer all the way to the, to the market. Uh, today, in, in Africa, we have 136,000 farmers on this, this program. Uh, we have increased their yields by 34%, and, um, and, and the farmer income by 83%. So it's an example of getting a private public partnership that really works and it creates a sustainable business model for the, for the farmer, but how do we bring that to, to scale? 136,000 farmers now, we have a vision of uh, getting that to one and a half million farmers uh, within the next few years, but uh, the need is much bigger than that, so how do we bring that even further to scale? But uh, it is possible to connect more than the World Food Program to this value chain, so that's a challenge that I think we all should take. Yeah, very briefly, I think that um, I, um, I like very much what you said, uh, Minister. Um, at the end of the day, the solution of scaling up has to be end-to-end, -end, has to be the total ecosystem. Not that I am against uh, the, that we improve the farmers, small farmers, but also we have to take into consideration the consumer. So it's uh, changing a little bit the concept that is not only from farm to fork, but also from fork to farm. At the end of the day, the consumers, they play an important role. You mentioned one example, that is, I mean, if the consumers, it does not resonate for them being a new technology, or even simple things that the consumers don't like the food that you're producing, then it's difficult that even if you get the correct incentives to the farmers, that you can, you can really be successful. And so let us think about end-to-end, -end, the total solution. And I think that in this direction, um, the, an example of um, blending everything you said here and to have a public uh, and private um, partnership that is effective, something that we do in Rwanda, it's called Africa Improved Foods. It's uh, together with the, uh, the, the World Bank, uh, together with the development banks of um, uh, the Netherlands and the UK, but also together with the government of Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And there we are talking and improving the capabilities of 9,000 smallholder farmers but at the same time, the product that we are producing their fortified cereals, they go hands to hands, what is the normal habit of the local population? In Rwanda, people are very used and they like very much a special kind of porridge. So if you don't take these two in consideration, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to push through something to the consumer. So uh, just to finalize, uh, one concept that we uh, like to introduce from the consumer point of view, if you want to make this a success and scale up and do things that uh, can be reproduced, three A's. For the consumer point of view, it needs to be available. Mm -hmm. It needs to be 
affordable. People have to be able to buy it. And last but not least, it needs to be aspirational. I want to eat this. Otherwise, I mean, it's very difficult to do end-to-end. Patrick, -end. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. can I build on this? This is a, it's a very good point. And, uh, you know, you mentioned the consumers, and I, I absolutely agree. You know, I mean, we need solutions that are market-driven. And who is at the end of the market? It's the end consumer. And when we look at, uh, at this, the mega trends globally in, 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 in food is, you know, we live in a very different time today. And when you look at the consumer today, the consumer today wants to know what is in my product. You know, if you drink your coffee, who produced that coffee? You know, those farmers who produce that coffee, have they received a fair salary? Has there been a, a, an environmental harm? And if a product does not comply with these standards today, these companies are running the risk of, of, of getting out of business. So the world has really changed. You know, we are, as a company, we are fair trade pioneers with a lot of products. And, uh, and uh, fair trade started like 30 years ago, where there was a very intransparent world. You had some rich countries, and you had the poor ones, and then the certification was like the label who was guaranteeing that if you buy that banana, you will help some farmer far away. The world today is very different. We live in a world of radical transparency. This means today, if you don't have a product that complies with this, you will be out of, out, out of the market. So we need to understand that whatever we want to do, you know, that transparency will be very critical. So this means food that, as, 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 as you said, that is healthy, you know, farmer, uh, consumers want healthy food, and they want to know that it is food that has produced social and environmental benefits. Very key point. Cuando, cuando me preparaba para moderar este debate, me encontré con eso. Moderate this debate. I found this marvelous document. I recommend it to everyone. It's extremely interesting. And on page six, it has a list of 17 arguments of why there is a need to transform food systems. I won't read all 17. I'm just going to read two. Almost 80% of poor people live in rural areas in the world and they work mainly in agriculture. Agriculture employs more people in the world than other industries. It employs about 60% of workers in less developed countries. This is extremely interesting. We know that in innovation we can find the answer. Technology is the answer. Why has it taken us so long to innovate? Why has it been so slow in agriculture? Where are the obstacles and hurdles? I had a startup in Latin America since 2012, and I think that we had some obstacles. For example, we developed hardware, and developing hardware in Latin America is a little complicated to have the components here. When I lived in the United States, I just ordered by Amazon and I'd get it the next day, but here it's not, doesn't work like that. So we have to innovate in that sense here. What's good about innovating in Latin America is that, for example, in Montevideo, which is where I live, I have a field that is just 30 minutes away from my house. So the producers are really close to me. I can go talk to a client, see what they need. So I think that for Latin America, we can innovate thinking about that, seeing what the problem is and how we can find a solution. But we've taken long because of the cost of technology here. And I'm talking about technology of IoT, for example. Rural producers have profit margins that are very, very low. So in order to offer a service that improves their yield and productivity and that doesn't generate them costs is very complicated. So we have to see how we can fund technology so that these producers can have access to the technology. And we also have rural connectivity issues. So in rural areas in Latin America, sometimes reaching certain areas with technology is very difficult. Minister Medina, you'd like to say something? I think that the question is extremely important. Why hasn't technology reached smallholders? I think we have to differentiate what a smallholder is in a rich country and in an emerging Latin American country. It's two completely different pro profiles. 
And within Latin America, we also have different levels as well. We have, to edu we have to analyze education. Technology and education go hand in hand. Low educational levels means low technological levels. Secondly, and this happens at least in Paraguay, we still have weaknesses as a state. We have states that are weak, that they don't have a lot of rural presence, and this becomes even harder with political ideologies. There are some ideologies that have been installed in the states and they go against technology. They don't think about food security, but they think about politics and the use of technology in goes against their ideology. And using politics can also go against this sometimes. The concept of a family agriculture in Latin America is politically ideological, let's say. It has a political ide tangent. And this is a segment that does not want to use technology due to ideology. And this is a huge challenge that we have to face. Yes, Patrick? Would you like to add something? Mauricio, did you want to add something?
I, I come from a different angle here. Let's, if you think about uh, successes we have in Latin America, mm -hmm. today we talk about Brazil, and Brazil is, I mean, will become, if not yet, the first producer of soy in the world. Uh, uh, the minister has mentioned that, uh, yeah, now you're number four in soy, you're number six in, in, in order, uh, number seven producer in, in corn. But this did not happen from day to night. So the point that I want to make here is that you need a vision and a strategic plan that is not a short-term strategic plan. You need to understand what are the dynamics and the different partners, moreover now, what they think and create a narrative and a plan that is hopefully robust and with a full loss implementation. And this, is, is, and this is not happening from day to night. Mm -hmm. And in building this, uh, hopefully, Minister, uh, this plan should navigate through the, dif the political differences that can have from the government perspective. And it's not only the plan that has to be implemented by the government, it has to involve all the partners, all the stakeholders that play a role into that. And again, I insist on that end to end. Bring consumers to the party, bring the small farmers also to the party. And, and having this plan, then I think we can tackle and speed up, perhaps we can, but it does not happen from day to night. Okay. He visto a varias personas acá en el público interesadas en formular preguntas a nuestro panel, así que podemos empezar. Allá tenemos a alguien, bueno, tenemos a dos personas, primero la chica y luego... Ladies first. tremendous power nowadays. Thank you. Quien responde? Who would like to answer? Uh, I, I think uh, the work that you do is uh, is really really good, and, and it's also focusing on the starting with the diet and, and see what the dietary needs are and how we can make that more sustainable as well, and then go backwards in the in the, in the value chain. And uh, we're part of um, uh, what's called the Follow the Food and Land Use Coalition, uh, where we also have the Eat Foundation in, uh, bringing in the, the science and the diet part of it, uh, and then linking that from the dietary needs all the way back to the farmer, and then creating a roadmap. Well, what does that mean for, say, us as a fertilizer company? What does it mean for the seed producers and the chemical producers? What does it mean for, for farmers? But to create this roadmap. But, uh, it's important that we have the diet in part, and uh, including the chefs in this is a, is a great uh, initiative. Victoria, could you add something? No, I think that it's uh, very important as a PR strategy. It's really important. I mean, for uh, some weeks ago, I think in London, some uh, restaurants were closed because they said the meat was coming from the UK, and it didn't. So it is. I think uh, consumers are starting to see that, and uh, chefs all of obviously are really important in the sense that if they put in their restaurant that's okay this meat comes from Uruguay it's a great place that uh, all the animals have been in open sky yeah I'm a, I'm a really fan of my country um, <laughs> I can see that <laughs> so but I mean it, it does it and it, it it raises the prices of the meat so it's the whole value the whole meat chain increases if in the restaurant in London the guy the, the chef can say okay here you have a tablet, here is where the meat, ha I mean, the animal has been, uh, and, and you, can, you can know that it had at least a, a good life while it was living. Okay. okay. Just a, mo a, mo a small comment then, uh, thanks, I mean, we, we have been working together in, into this topic, we're one of the partners of Gaston Motiva. I think the, the, um, the, the point here is also, uh, we, we said that before, we had to segment, I mean, wh where the chefs can really play a role. Uh, the, the developed and the uh, developing countries. And I think um, one important thing to, uh, of the chefs being a voice now that more and more has gained space is the understanding by the chefs what is a nutritious food. 
Uh, they, they really focus on what is aspirational and what makes sense, really, that I mean, is appealing and then it tastes is good. But also, we cannot dissociate this from nutrition. Obesity is becoming a tremendous issue globally. And then if the chefs are becoming now stronger and their voice is heard, they have to understand that empty calories make no sense. We have to <laughs> cover everything, make this not only aspirational, but also nutritional. Okay. Now we go here, here, and then there, please. Yeah. I think uh, when you look to the whole supply chain, I mean, I work for a company, uh, for Louis Dreyfus, I mean, uh, you're talking on fruit. We're the third, the third largest fruit producer in the world. We have fair trade, rainforest program. And I think there's a big challenge on how we give scale to the small farmer to go uh, to the final consumer. Um, and I think how to properly remunerate the small farmer to be doing such a way. And I think, I mean, without really having scale, it's very difficult to make that product come in an affordable way, cheap, to the final consumer that want to get that. And I think there are large organizations, such as the one that I work, but I think even much more important than that, when you, ha when you have the people that are really having the brand and more important than that, people in the supermarket that will be really willing to be giving that transparency and to promote that. I think we talk about a lot on what we can do to have technology accessible to the small farmer so he can produce more efficient, how he can gain more. Uh, we talk about what the consumer wants because we, we, we see that, I mean, the consumer wants to be having product coming from a small farmer, product that is produced sustainably, that is really remunerating and helping small holders or small, poor people. Uh, but to, to be linking to this one, I think there is one step that I think today is kind of seen as evil on the big brands. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you look at the value of the big brands in comparison to some uh, of the people that are really applying technology to the final consumer is going in opposite direction. Uh, but I think there's a, a role that I think is super important uh, to be able to have this really income transfer and I think the role of that one, I think supermarket has a key role uh, in okay. doing that. And we talk nothing about that. And that's most of the food uh, sold in the world is through big supermarkets. And uh, at least from what I feel, I don't see a big role of the supermarkets playing and really willing to be doing some advertisement or some transferring of that income going across the value chain. So I think there is one step in the value chain, which includes massive amount of food uh, being sold in the world that I think is missing on this debate. And I think the question I have, uh, it's just a, it was a <laughs> statement more than a question. Yes, I'm waiting for the question. So the question I have is, um, really, I think when we have companies like, I mean, we have Amazon buying Whole Foods, and I mean, we have Alibaba buying China and going, mm -hmm. uh, we, I, I think there's an opportunity for these guys to be entering the landscape and to giving the transparency. So the question is, do you feel like, I mean, from the fair trade perspective, from the small holders, how does the technology on the people that are selling uh, everything through the web to be, have a role to be changing this, this landscape? Do you feel like this company can really be selling food and making this connection in a more uh, sustainable and fair way? I mean, this is a very good question. And I think it's a very relevant question. And when we look at this, I think from the very beginning, we need to be aware that working with small-scale farmers, we're setting a very high bar. You know, so we're doing something that's really difficult. Because as I said initially, you know, you're competing with large-scale farmers. So how can you do this? And you were mentioning the, 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 the consumer. And when you look at the fair to go the organic, and you walk into Whole Foods, you know, I mean, you pay 50% more for organic or, or, you know, so the price dif differential is just too high. So I think when we look at this, when we look at, 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 at that challenge, we need to look at really understanding how can we bring, uh, uh, how can we make small scale farmers more, more, more uh, uh, productive? Is there something of economies of scale for small scale farmers that we can bring the price point down? I think this will be uh, uh, very important. And as I said earlier, fair trade started 30 years ago in an intransparent world. Now I think we need, the goal should be now to democratize fair trade. If we can work together and find alliances that we can bring economies of scale to this and we can disrupt also the supply chain. Because when you look at just, you mentioned looking at the entire supply chain. When you see how much the small scale farmer makes and how much you pay when you walk into Tesco or you walk into Whole Foods and you pay for a banana, 
and you see them all these margins, you will see that in the long run, these, this will not be sustainable. So there will be, there will be disruption, and I think solutions need to come across the supply chain. You know, starting on the ground, looking at how can we use uh, logistics more efficiently, effectively, and, 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 and making a more direct link between product, producer and markets. Okay, we have another question here. So, please. Patrick, let me, let me offer you a different perspective. I'm not sure if I completely agree with one statement that you said, and I w just want to offer one perspective to you. I think that we have a very successful business model for smallholders, farmers, that has economy of scale and end-to-end -end on the supply chain. And I think we need to talk more about that one. So let me, let me give you a, a, a practical example. I was with a, a farmer uh, two weeks ago, very small farmer, uh, less than five hectares. So, but suddenly this farmer is in the south of Brazil and he's connected with one cooperative. And the cooperative model in Brazil is the, what I think is a huge solution. When I, when I went to, to Mexico, and Mexico is a corn importer, it's impressive to, to say that. And you have hundreds of thousands of farmers planting open pill, pollinate corn and they cannot make it because they are selling the corn to the coyotes on the, on the road. If you go to the south of Brazil and you go to one of these regions like Santa Catarina and Paraná, uh, you have smallholders farmers connected to a cooperative. So let me give you a, a practical example again. This farmer is connected to a cooperative that congregates 25,000 farmers, all smallholders farmers, right? And smallholders farmers to adopt technology, they need four things in our view, based on my experience also in East Europe or even in Africa. Four things, they need to have credit. They don't have finance to acquire technology sometimes. Even if the technology returns the investments, they don't have the financial terms. The second is that they, they need to have inputs on a reasonable cost and they need to have a technical assistance and how to sell their grains not to uh, intermediate. So if you think about the cooperative models in the south of Brazil, they offer exactly these four things, right? So they, they, this cooperative, they buy inputs for 25,000 farmers, not a single farmer acquisition. They have 320 agronomists in the ground. They're selling their grains uh, directly to China, and they're doing integration with poultry, uh, sometimes even fish or swine. So I just think that when, I, when, I, when we, st we talk a lot about the smallholders, farmers, I, I offer the perspective that we have in Brazil, in the south of Brazil, a very good example of smallholders, farmers, successful, that can have economy of scale, end-to-end -end, uh, supply chain, and can be competitive. So we think a lot about the, the big farmers in Mato Grosso in Brazil, but Santa Catarina, the average is one hectare. Uh, so I just offer that because I think that we need to replicate even forums like this one. We need to talk a little bit more about this cooperative model. I know that takes 40 to 50 years to, <laughs> to mature, as, as the time that we had here in Brazil, but it's a great solution for smallholders farms. It's, it's less about the technology itself, but how you organize them to have economy scale, end-to-end -end, uh, supply chain. Alguien quiere agregar algo sobre el tema? So maybe just quickly. So I mean, I, I absolutely agree. You know, you cannot help a small-scale farmer in isolation. So you need to form cooperatives. We formed a lot of cooperatives. That's the, the, the best way of, of, uh, of uh, getting economies of scale. You mentioned the key points with financial technical assistance. So I look at this from a global perspective. You know, in this in the southern part of Brazil, perfect. There are other areas where you have the, the small scale farmer more scattered around, around the country, you know, where it's more difficult, you know. But we need to think along these lines. I mean, I absolutely agree with what you said. Yeah, I, I fully support what you said. And the main question for all of us here is who will then make the sharing of this knowledge? Who will make this effective sharing that is not kept only in the south of Brazil? Yeah, and, and perhaps uh, if you do that, we can shorten the period where we're talking here is scaling up. And if we can do this in a way that we find um, people responsible, brokers, that br bring this information, how do I do that? And do the effective sharing, not only the sharing, the effective sharing. Sometimes people share, but the, the receiving part say, oh, it works in the south of Brazil, not here. 
So then how can we make sure that we bring a compelling vision and how the cooperatives can work? And then I, I think it's a question that I, I, I leave to, the, to, the, to, to us here uh, in this panel because we need to work into that. This is a, a, a solution, it's a proven solution, but we need to work harder. We have another question here, please yeah. go ahead. Following the introduction, I was born in Concordia, Santa Catarina, many, many years ago, in a city that is dedicated uh, to the production integrated with small farmers. And these are properties of family owned. I was also chairman of the Brazilian Association of uh, Chicken Exporter. Brazil, as you may know, is the largest exporter of chickens. And this company, founded in Santa Catarina, is the largest worldwide exporter. And we have around 15,000 small farmers in a system of integration. And I could describe the integration system that was created in Brazil in the late 60s, beginning of the 70s. Uh, first with hogs, then with chickens, then with turkeys and today is spread all over Brazil with cooperatives and companies. Uh, we transfer technology, training, standards. Uh, the production is sustainable because we take, the, take care of the environment. Most of the waste of the production is uh, transformed in fertilizer and also the production of biogas with the waste of hogs. You fermented, mm -hmm. fermented transform in biogas that can move the electric engines at the farm. They have low risk because all the risk is holded by the company that integrates, that supply uh, also the grandparents' stock and the parents' stock and the baby pots. Uh, productivity could be uh, improving uh, according to quality. So there is a premium price to the farmers that overpass the average standards. Mm -hmm. uh, the feed, this company produces 10 million tons of feed is the largest user of feed in Brazil and buy the raw materials from small farmers and large farmers. Logistic is also controlled mm. and processing, sales and distribution. We are able to use traceability. We know where the birds and the hogs are coming from we could sell a ham saying where the hogs were produced and where the industry is okay. located. All these faces until now, even selling to 150 countries protectionism, for instance, US up to now has not opened the entrance of Brazilian products in this area. Okay. So the model I know has been replicated in Paraguay successfully, and this model could be replicated anywhere. I think Sven has something to say about it. Yes, I, I just wanted to, to say that uh, I, I think uh, we, we can all take a lot of uh, inspiration from the cooperatives in, in Brazil, uh, and, and there are some many really successful ones where you connect. But just uh, to say, uh, this company is a listed company, including in New York, so mm. cooperatives are welcome, mm. but in some way mm. we are in the same boat. Mm. But, it, but it's all about uh, and connecting also smallholder farmers to be part of a larger group and sharing the knowledge and, and then connecting to the, to the market. And I think when, it, when you bring this to, uh, to scale, um, it doesn't have to be so that uh, producing food in a sustainable way is more expensive. When, you brought, to, when brought to scale from, from, uh, from start to, to end, it is possible to... Uh, reduce food waste as well. Today, one third of the food produced is lost before it reaches the consumer, and, and that's a huge source for uh, financing of a more sustainable mm -hmm. uh, food production system. So, I think through transparency, we will 
be able to create a more uh, responsible food production system, but also more affordable food production system. Okay. Bueno, nos quedan solo unos minutos para finalizar esta sesión y quisiera que cada uno de ustedes me dé una idea final eh, que sirva para mm, aportar alguna propuesta a nuestro tema de hoy, a cómo emplear a escala la innovación en agricultura. Mauricio, adelante, empieza, empieza tú. Ok, very, very, very assertive, I think, three, three points. One, resilient funding and investment. It has to be resilient. If you don't invest in innovation, you never scale it up. Number two is global, global developments and local solutions, quite important. And everything done, third point, under a sustainable way. We cannot call ourselves successful in uh, this, what we're talking about is scaling up innovation in a world that fails. Mm -hmm. Okay, Victoria? Um, I think that's something that I want to really, really highlight is the needs that we have for precision farming and precision agriculture. Um, we talked a lot about smallholder farm, uh, small farmers, but at the same time, we have to, to know, I mean, how to prevent, for example, diseases, um, uh, catastrophes, for example, in climate, index-based insurance that is so important for farmers, because what happens if a small farmer loses uh, its cows because of food and mouth disease or because of any other disease, they are le left with no income and no intake. I mean, many times they, that cow gives them like the food that they have. So I think it's very, very important to invest in precision farming, precision agriculture, not only to improve the productivity of the farmers, but also to prevent um, something that can be catastrophic. Okay, so then a final idea? Yeah, just uh, on the responsible uh, business, and it was mentioned from, from the audience, so, um, we still have a lot of uh, actors out there that are not thinking uh, holistically and are not thinking about uh, responsibly produced uh, food. I believe that the ones that don't get that now risk being extinct in a very short time frame. And we see that uh, now from one of the world's largest investors, Larry Fink in BlackRock. He says that businesses that don't think about uh, a greater good in society, uh, broader than just the top line and bottom line, risk losing their support. So this is happening right now. Mm -hmm. And I think the ones that realize it now will have an advantage. The ones that don't will be out of business. Okay, thank you. Ministro Medina? Uh, three main points. The first one, um, <coughs> technology has to be affordable for small holes particularly. Uh, it has to be easy to use. And the second one is we have to think about innovation and technology strategically. strategically. We have to have a plan. We have to think in, in terms of having a plan uh, as a block, as a, as a value chain to transfer that uh, technology. And the third uh, point, and we think we have we have we haven't talked a lot, of, but it's very important, is communication. We have to be able to communicate to both sides, to producer, the importance of use technology, and also to the consumer of the importance of technology. I totally agree of uh, organic production as a niche market, but the consumer has to know that if we pretend to feed the world in, 50, in 20 or 30 mm -hmm. years just with organic production, that will be impossible. Mm -hmm. We have to be able to communicate that to people. Okay, Patrick? So, I mean, we started this panel by, you know, looking at what are these global challenges. And I think the, the, the goal of this panel is coming up with solutions. And I think what is very critical is that we recognize that we need collaborations. You know, we need collaboration between different sectors and uh, with different uh, players. And, uh, and uh, you know, there is a saying in Spanish that says, Zapatero a tus zapatos. <laughs> and, uh, and I think if we manage that we give a farmer who is born to be a farmer the tools in his hand that he can be the best farmer, and the one who does logistics to be the best in logistics, the one who does the market, the, the selling, the best in selling, and we manage to connect these dots in a very lean way, I think we really have the, 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 the potential in our hands to make a significant change. And if we can use technology to support this, we can reach the, the 500 million small-scale farmers who need that support. Bueno, pues con esto damos por terminada esta sesión, Scaling Up Innovation in Agriculture. Gracias a todos por haber estado aquí. Obrigada y hasta una próxima ocasión. Gracias. <laughs>